Hello, this is Dirk Manning here, the writer and creator of Tales of Mystery, Nightmare World, Hope, and many, many other comics. And uh, you're watching Two Geeks Talking, which is amazing. So uh, enjoy. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a returning guest. He might have been on the show five or six times by now, if not a little more. I think he holds the record currently for the most times as a guest on Two Geeks Talking. We are joined today by the master of all things horror, Dirk Manning, once more, talking about a brand new volume of Tales of Mystery, a Kickstarter going on, and we're going to dive into what it takes to not only have a successful crowdfunding campaign, but all the little nuances that maybe you don't know about that maybe makes your Kickstarter fail or maybe makes your campaign not as successful as it as it could be. So, Dirk, welcome back to Two Geeks Talking. Thank you, man. It's good to see you. Yeah, I was trying to think, too, as you were counting, how many times have we... It's over five for sure. You're, mm -hmm. you're definitely in the five timers club. You, you're you six was if six, if not seven was earlier this year. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I appreciate it. it. And, you know, one of the reasons that it's so easy to chat with you so much is because I find we always get, you, you always get to like steer the conversations in different ways, things like that. And for those people just tuning in now, I'm really excited to talk to you about crowdfunding and Kickstarter and things like that. I love the, I love the how to, I love the science of type stuff that we get to do here. So I'm, I'm ready, man. I appreciate it. Thank you. I've run Kickstarters in the past. They've not been successful. And that's, that's demoralizing in the sense that, you know, you've put all this effort into creating the product and, and getting the, the word out almost to the point of, you know, needing a cease and desist order and all that other stuff from the people <laughs> you contact, among other things there. But what do you think makes a successful campaign when you first start? Gosh, you know, um, the thing with crowdfunding is that I, I, I tell people there's two fundamental steps to crowdfunding. The, the first one is you have to have a crowd, which I know that seems very obvious, almost to the point of insulting. But I think that fundamental truth, that foundational element of what you bring to the table as, as a creator or creative is very crucial to honor. And, and you need to recognize, do I have a crowd? Whether that crowd be your, your friends and family or your peers in your industry or whatever. Do you have a crowd? What is your crowd? What does that look like? Then after that, just as crucial is the secondary part of your foundation, which is, can you activate them? That, that's a whole different piece of the puzzle in itself, that, but that's also very relevant. You know, in your case, you know, you have a crowd, you do this podcast, you know, tons of people and things like that. But then the question is, can you activate that crowd to get behind what you're doing? It's funny, a crowdfunding campaign that doesn't work out to someone's expectations, I find it's rarely, and from my experience, what I've seen, a, a matter of that project not being of a high quality or not being very much a passion project, something that that it, that's good, you know. However, you, however you want to quantify that metric, but rather it, it's a matter of not being able to engage people in a way that will support the project, or conversely, perhaps overestimating the engagement you'd be able to get to help make it successful. The whole activation of the crowd itself, too. And I see I've been seeing this a lot more lately. Now that I've been interviewing a lot more people. With with Kickstarter campaigns is that even before their actual campaign is, is ongoing, they're pushing for a hundred backers or they're pushing for pre backers or something along that line to, to showcase that yeah, the yes, their project has legs They follow. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Is, is that been something that's triggered more recently or has that been always kind of a thing? I think that's more recent. And here's the thing. There's all kinds of math and all kinds of metrics to this. And one of the things they find is that, uh, statistically speaking, the more followers you have up front, the more likely your campaign will be successful because of your activation rate from followers to backers. Mm -hmm. And the way Kickstarter, for example, and, and just for the sake of this conversation, somebody knows listening to this, I know there are other crowdfunding platforms out there like Indiegogo and things like that. I don't have 
any experience with those. I've started with Kickstarter. I That's my lane. With Kickstarter specifically, you can get notified upon launch. And, and there's been a recent drive lately for people, like you said, when you get ready to launch a campaign, follow the campaign. That way you'll be notified upon launch. And what they find is that your conversion rate of those people backing your campaign is much higher. The other thing is when you're notified upon launch, if you have backed the campaign, I think it's like three days before the end of the campaign, you get a little follow-up email. Like, by the way, this was a campaign you're interested in and it's in the final days. So if you want to back it, don't forget. Because one of the things that's so fascinating to me about people that back campaigns, uh, Kickstarter especially, a lot of people say, well, okay, well, I'm going to do it when I get paid. I get it, and I, and I respect the financial responsibility. You want to make sure you have the money there. But part of me is always like, too, the money doesn't come out until the end of the campaign. <laughs> you know, for Tales of Mystery, you know, we talked about the Tales of Mystery Volume 5 and, and Act 1 Omnibus, which you can see at talesofmystery.com. The campaign doesn't end until November 19th, so the money won't come out till after that. And I have people tell me that I'm really excited about backing the campaign. I just want to wait till I get paid and make sure my money's in the account. That lizard brain part of you that is, you know, really like, oh, I got I to gotta unlock stretch goals. I got to get funded. You know, it's like, well, back it now and, and get that money committed. It doesn't go out till the end anyway. But people, you know, have to back to the level of comfort. Specifically in regards to the followers, what they find is people that follow it. You get a, and I don't remember the exact number, if it's 30% or if it's 50% or something like that. But statistically speaking, uh, you know, I think it's somewhere between like 25 to 50 percent of the people that follow your campaign are almost guaranteed to be backers. So that's 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 what's up with that. With the variety of social media, especially for promotion between TikTok, Instagram, Facebook slash Meta slash Twitter slash whatever else is, is currently out there, the amount of promotion by the actual creator of the campaign itself seems like and, and I've said this on the show before, you know, it. Kickstarter campaigns or campaigns in general are a second job, quite literally, because of all the active promotion that you have to do regarding this. How does one even try to avoid the burnout factor? Because if your campaign's going for 30, 60 days, 90 days even for that matter, and I think a lot more people are doing 30, 30 days because of the, the success rate of that 30 days, um, how do you avoid the burnout factor with trying to constantly promote and push and, and not feel pushy? It's tough. You know, I, part of me hates me when I run a campaign because I really enjoy social media as a way to share with my tribe and people who like what I like, things that are of interest, you know, whether it be funny memes, obviously it's something that a lot of us, you know, use to help brighten our day. But my big interests are, you know, horror, comics, heavy metal, professional wrestling, and ice cream. That's what I like. If you like those things, that is primarily what you normally see from me on social media, you know, nine months out of the year. And those three other months interspersed, if I'm having me running a crowdfunding campaign, my mind is on my crowdfunding campaign. My mind is on my new book release. And I, I find my, I have to remind myself to do the, the jab, jab, punch model, which is every one time I post about my Kickstarter, I should be posting two times about things that are not the new book release. Anything more than a 30-day campaign is, uh, I personally think that's almost ridiculous, you know, because one of the things with, with crowdfunding is you want to create a, a moral sense of urgency as well, which is you have 30 days to get a certain version of the book, whether it be an exclusive cover or a hard cover or all stretch goals, whatever it is. You know, years ago, I, I knew a guy that said posting on social media is like throwing red paint in the ocean. He said, for 30 seconds, everybody sees it. And in 60 seconds, it was, it's like it was never there. And I, and I found that very, very profound. And it's true. And then, uh, you know, uh, I don't think it's a, a secret at this point, or at least it's an open secret, that Facebook really tends to tamp down on posts mm -hmm. that talk about Kickstarter. I think it's really a matter of time before Facebook starts their own crowdfunding engine. And I think that's part of the reason why you know, to keep everything insular within that, uh, that ecosystem. Yeah, it, it, it's tough. And you have to maintain your, your, your sense of self, your sense of center, but also let people know because inevitably every time, every time I run a campaign, the campaign will end and someone will be like, oh my gosh, I knew you were running a campaign. And I'm like, Bro, if I said it anymore, I would, I, I, you know, I don't know what to do. <laughs> you know? 
But the other the other thing to your question specifically on social media, you have to go into the plan. And if you're doing a four week campaign, I have different types of advertising promotion lined up for week one, week two, week three, week four. And that's something that I really try to stick to that strategy, you know, and 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 have and you gotta go, you gotta go in having a battle plan. You know, I mean, he, I'd sound all Sun Tzu or war about it. You have to have a plan. You have to have a strategy. You also have to recognize you're going to get a lot. Oftentimes, at least with my campaigns, I get a very large amount of engagement the first 24 to 48 hours. Uh, anybody running a month long campaign will tell you like that week two, three slog is yeah. brutal. You know, you're just not going to get that that rapid ex- acceleration. You have to kind of plan for that accordingly and recognize that you might get a back or a day if you're lucky sometimes, or you're just not going to get that crazy amount like you do up front. Then the last 48 hours of the campaign, things go wild again. And there's these statistics and studies that demonstrate time and time again, I want to say it you'll get half of what you get in the first 48 hours in the last 48 hours. And and you want to factor that in too. But in regards to social media, you know, it, it's funny. I'll always inevitably lose a couple of followers during the campaign. It just happens because <laughs> people are like, you know what? F this. This is what he's going to be talking about the next 30 days. I'm out. <laughs> I get it. Cool. And, and again, whether or not that's directly correlational to me promoting a campaign or just the, just I happen to notice it more during a campaign. I, I couldn't tell you, you know, there's always people leaving social media, coming back, retreating new accounts, things like that. But you got to have a plan, man. You got to have a plan going in. I recently did for Buried But Not Dead, I did a, uh, you know, this book right here. I did a 15-day quick starter. And I'll tell you what, part of me was like, I may never go back. Two weeks in and out, you know, with this campaign. But smaller book, you know, we had much less, um, many many fewer stretch goals and things like that. Uh, We added some stories to the book, bookmark. The double signed book plate by cover artist Jan Apple. Oh, and then we added some story. We added three stories to the book. That was it. We did, I think, almost 15 grand in 15 days, give or take, something like that. Oh, and it was cool. It was really successful. But then when you look at like Tales of Mystery, we're doing uh, a whole new 140 page book with Tales of Mystery Volume 5. We're also then doing the Omnibus, which collects the first four volumes, which is 550 pages. So we're looking at 700 pages of content, and I really want to offer, we're offering, we just unlocked uh, yesterday the ninth stretch goal, as I'm talking to you right now. We're about to unlock stretch goal number 10. This is a different beast. This is a 30-day campaign. But I have some other stuff coming up in the future where I might look at doing, a, again, a 15-day campaign or even a 20-day campaign just to shorten that window because of the burnout I can receive promoting it on social media for longer, as well as recognizing that people have a chance to get it or they don't. There's one thing I, I've learned recently, and uh, some creators are doing what I'm calling rolling campaigns. And rolling campaigns are when they have created a volume of a comic, mm-hmm. a product, right? issue issue one of, of, say, 12 issues, and they do their 30-day campaign. And during that time, they're promoting the heck out of it. And by the time the second campaign, by the time the first campaign ends, they're prepping for a second campaign Mm -hmm. to promote issue two and doing the same continuously. So either that provides more products for the people that maybe get on to campaign three, four, or five later on, or it's just a way to keep their product in the eye of people on social media with the short attention spans. What do you think about rolling campaigns? I tend to plan out my release schedule a year to two years in advance. Okay. Now I am, I'm prepping for inevitable Kickstarters for books that I haven't even started formally scripting yet, <laughs> you know, um, but I also have a different model that I tend not to do issue by issue. I tend to do book by book. I think that's great. You know, uh, I think the rolling campaign idea is a really good one for people who are using Kickstarter as their primary distribution model. Kickstarter in and of itself is a distribution model of comics. You know, it's, it, for creators that maybe aren't in Diamond or don't have a publisher, you know, and they're, they're self-publishing, I think it's a phenomenal idea. You know, originally my goal would have been to do a Tales of Mystery book every every October with the amount of other books I have going on at this point in my career and things like that. I mean, that's just a little more 
unrealistic. But but originally that's kind of what I planned is I guess like a semi rolling campaign. But I think it's great um, if you can get people engaged in that level and 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 brand yourself as a creator and just say okay, just know that every three months, because I think probably the earliest you'd be able to do something like that is every three months. You know, you run the campaign for a month. It takes a month to get the books back and print them and then ship them back out. That's month three. Yeah, four times a year, you're releasing your new book right on. You know, you look at guys like Brian Polito, who've just run the game on Kickstarter with his books, you know. And, and it's interesting when you look back at Brian's career, you know, all the way back to the Chaos Comic days up to where he is now and how... I mean, he, he's a king of Kickstarter. People call me like, oh, you know, you're a king of Kickstarter, you know, blah, 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 you know. And I'm like, look, my total on Kickstarter is over 400,000 so far. Well, almost half a million, which is incredible. That's just on Kickstarter. You know, that doesn't count diamond sales, convention sales, anything else. That's really, really cool. You got guys like Brian Polito who can do that in one or two campaigns. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Brian's a guy that really, this has become his distribution model, you know, his primary distribution model. And, and I think it's great. And uh, that's the thing about crowdfunding that's so cool is it's really democracy in action for a creator, you know, and, and if you can set up a system like that, I, I, I think you should. I'm planning right now. One, two, my next four in various stages of planning with my publisher, with SourcePoint Press. That's that's a year out, minimum, minimum a year out. Realistically, it's probably closer to a year and a half at this point, you know, but yeah, you gotta plan ahead. This is business, you gotta have a business plan, you gotta go. This is not just if you build it, they will come. This particular creator, what, they, what they're doing is not only with that rolling campaign, but they're using that data, they're collecting that data of the successes of their campaigns. Mm -hmm. They're collecting, showcasing it into maybe a, a presentation of some kind to showcase to actual publishers like Source Point Press or like Image or like whatever. Right. To actually say, hey, here's my creator owned comic. Here's what I've created. Mm -hmm. Here's my numbers. Here's the amount of backers I've had. Would you like to publish this? I mean, what do you think about that? I think a lot of it's going to depend on the mindset of the publisher as well. It's going to be tricky. Um, I was very fortunate to work with Shadowline with Jim Valentino at their image for a while. And back in the day when I originally broached the Kickstarter idea, he wasn't really into it. You know, that wasn't really the model at the time that he wanted to follow. And there's a mentality amongst some publishers through Kickstarter you are marketing to the people most likely to support your book. So what does that leave me as a publisher? Hmm. To which I would say, well, by having a book at SourcePoint Press, for example, and obviously SourcePoint Press is very supportive of the Kickstarter model, but I'd say, okay, what else can I get out of, out of this book? And, and how else can you market it now as being a part of your, your brand? Very But Not Dead? originally was not even marketed as a source point press book because there's no guarantee this was going to become a source point press book. What happened was when they saw the final product, they said, wow, you just, you know, pre-sold, you know, close to 15 grand in books in, in 15 days. Yeah, we'll release that. We'll release that. And now what they're seeing is conventions and things like that. This book flies. You know, people that know nothing about my work, look at this book and say, I want that. And I'll start telling them what it is. They're good. Like, no, no, this, I like this cover. I like the, I like, just done, in. And I haven't had a book pop off my table as fast as I have since, like, Nightmare World 1, you know, with this book. Having SourcePoint Press, I mean, I can't speak for them, but having this book in their library, you know, I would hope supports their brand about, okay, you know, here, here's a instantly accessible horror anthology by a guy that's done a lot of books that's like a supernatural sampler this is a book that meets their needs in that regard so i think showing that you can sell books i think showing that you can create books i think showing you can do the work i think forward-thinking publishers would look at this and say okay let's have that conversation you know let's look at what 
We know this person can make a book. We know that they're driven to market it. How can we slot them into what we're doing in order for everyone to continue to maximize it and then give it a second life in a larger distribution model? Looking at all the publishers that have been around throughout the years and that are currently still around here, uh, you, you said SourcePoint Press obviously is, is a fan of the of the Kickstarter model, which is wonderful to see. Why do you think it's taken the big two or or image or any of those larger publishers to either warm up to the Kickstarter ride? I think a lot of it's backlash from social media. Lest we forget back in the day when Archie Comics tried to launch a Kickstarter. Oh, yeah. Remember that? Oh, People yeah. lost their minds. They're like, why does Archie need to do a Kickstarter? You're crowding out the little people, blah, blah, blah. I wanted to say to people, when's the last time you bought an Archie comic? Uh, no offense to Archie. No offense to Archie. But a lot of these people that were saying, oh, you know, Archie doesn't need to do this. They're an established brand. It's like, well, they're established, but they're, find, they're trying to find a way to reinvigorate themselves as a, as a publisher and access a new model and access a new, a new market. What, what's interesting now is that like uh, with Boom, with Berserker, with Keanu Reeves, same thing. All these people went nuts about it, you know, uh, in positive ways and negative ways. I mean, they had a monster campaign and people, but, but a lot of creators were like, oh, great. Now Keanu Reeves is here. He's crowding us out. Mm-hmm. Again, it's democracy in action, friends. Another example, and, and I, I, I've never spoken on this publicly, but uh, Elvira doing her comics or do the, doing the comics with her on Kickstarter. I don't know the numbers on the Elvira comics. I know Elvira's uh, 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 a franchise that has had many comics to many different publishers over the years. And again, and I'm speaking on a turn here. I, I hope someone will take the time to politely correct me, but I, I'm going to hypothesize that those Elvira comics always did okay. I'm sure they did okay. You know, I, I, I love Elvira. You know, I, I think she, she's fantastic. She was formative on my career in a lot of ways, personally, and professionally, you know, and I, I love everything she stands for. But when they started taking the Elvira comics to Kickstarter, they're seeing monster numbers in their pre-sales. And I'm willing to bet that they saw just as much, if not more, sales on Kickstarter up front than they did on the run of some of these comics later. Because, again, there's all these people who never walked into a comic shop, but then found out, I really like Elvira. She's got a comic. I can prove it on this Kickstarter thing. That's pretty awesome. And you get Elvira to drop a promo to, boom, go. Or when we look at myself with uh, Butts and Seats, the Tony Giovanni story, right? I can't tell you how many people have never read a comic before, but they jumped in on the crowdfunding because they specifically wanted to support Tony Giovanni. Kickstarter is a, is a new distribution model, and it's a way for people to directly connect with the brand and directly connect with, with the work. I, I think that's exciting. And in regards to major publishers doing I think it's trickier for like a Marvel or DC to do it because Marvel or DC builds their brands around properties more than creators. Hmm. That's not a slam. That's just the reality. They're going to promote Spider-Man and they'll say, okay, this guy or this girl, whomever is working on Spider-Man. And when that person leaves, they're going to say, well, the next person is on Spider-Man or X-Men or whatever it is. So I, I think with Marvel and DC specifically, it's going to be trickier for them to enter this arena because I think ultimately crowdfunding and Kickstarter is about, again, that democracy in action. And there's a personal connection there, supporting people you like. You know you're getting a book from me. You know you're supporting a book by Tony Schiavone or Elvira. Whatever. And it, and it creates a sense of connection there that I think a lot of people really, really appreciate. But the other avenue is it's not just about the product itself. You mentioned stretched goals early on as well, too. And that's something that obviously in the planning side of things, you you have to take into account because yeah. you don't know. And, and to be perfectly honest, even if you're brand new to this or not, even though you love your product and you have a high quality product of a, of a book or whatever you're trying to put together, you don't know if it's actually going to reach the goal of 100% funded. Right. And you don't know if you're going to be able to make enough money to get to even your first stretch goals. How do you take into account with your plan, your stretch goals, and 
to cover at least the cost of the book itself. Pre-planning, brother. You like got to do your research. You got to look into this stuff. I'll be real. And I'm going to be really real about stretch goals. The key is, as a creator, to offer high value, low cost. There's a way to do that. We look at the Tales of Mystery campaign that I'm running right now. One of the stretch goals uh, we've unlocked is a print of the cover of the omnibus by James Obar. He's allowing us to make an, a, a limited edition Kickstarter exclusive print of that cover. Now, one of the things I have to look at is making sure that the print fits inside the box with the books. It doesn't get beat up because it's not a print and people want it to look good. Okay. Prints are not terribly expensive, but it's really cool to have it knowing this is the only way you can get it. Well, then I'll sign the print. And when we unlock the next stretch goal, which we're getting pretty close as of this, this recording, James Obar will sign the print. Now you get a print that not only you'll never really get again, but it's signed by the writer and it's signed by James Obar, creator of The Crow. That's pretty high value. How much does it cost me to sign that print? A couple bucks for markers, a little bit of time. Mm -hmm. James Obar, I got to ship the prints to him. I'm going to pay him a little bit of money to sign them. But I have to make sure that the amount of money I am spending on the print, the postage there and back, the markers, and the signing fever that I'm, I want to give him, uh, or the, the, the money to give him to sign a couple hundred prints, let's say, for argument's sake, I'm looking at, and I'm going to go a high number. Mm -hmm. Let's say it's 500 all in. That's not unrealistic. No. To get those three levels... On my campaign, it, we have to pre-sell three grand worth of product. Hmm. Okay. So now that means automatically my price differential <clears throat> becomes 2,500. That's fine. But you also have to remember, we're not talking about $2,500 worth of profit. That means I have to sell $3,000 more worth of product. So then what's my profit on selling $3,000 worth of profit, knowing that realistically most of these pledges are going to come from getting the $35 hardcover, the $85, the $60 omnibus, the $85 both books. Then from that, you got to figure out how much the shipping is going to cost. I can hear some people's minds just melting right now about all the math you have to do. But you got to know your economics. You got to know what you're looking at. And you have to offer high value, low cost. When I did, I'll give you another example. Mm -hmm. When we did the Nightmare World, the campaign for the Nightmare World Omnibus, we ended up unlocking this, mm -hmm. the Nightmare World Bible. Leather bound, gold gilded pages, bookmark, slip case, bonus book. I give a lot of credit and a lot of props and a lot of thanks to Devil's Due for letting me do this. I was insane. I was insane. I made no extra money on that campaign. You know, we, I think we had a $13,000 funding goal and we ended up doing over 45,000. I didn't make an extra dime because I took all that extra profit and just kept putting it into making a bigger and better and better book. A beautiful book too. Yeah. But I'm not gonna lie. This was like my, my, my vanity thing. I always said since I started Nightmare World's online comic back in the early 2000s, someday I want to make a leather bound, slip cased, gold gilded pages, you know. Yeah. And the readers really got behind it because they wanted to unlock this version. And they got it for free. You don't you can't walk into a store and buy this. This was Kickstarter exclusive, right? So that's the other thing. It's high value. Now this one was a little bit higher cost, but it was worth it. So now that we're doing Tales of Mystery, again, you, you have to look at low cost to me, high value to everyone else. Uh, on the Mystery campaign, you get a sticker, you get a book plate signed by me, signed by illustrator Austin McKinley. Uh, he's doing a little head sketch remark on each one. That's really cool. That's high value. You know, we're getting a, a print bonus comic with two Kickstarter exclusive stories. That's the next run of stretch goals. Originally, we we're going to offer one story, then two stories, both digital. 
Now they're both in print. That's high value. Those stories are not going to be reprinted. The only way you can get those stories is through the Kickstarter. Now we have the Jim, Jim O'Barr art print, right? Uh, signed by me, hopefully signed by James O'Barr. Kickstarter exclusive. The only way you'll get it. High value, not a really high cost in the scheme of things, but it's a cool item to get. A lot. The last thing on this campaign that we have announced right now is a Tales of Mystery free video game download. What? Yeah, that one, again, I'm breaking my own rule. <laughs> I, I, I'm my own worst enemy sometimes. Yeah, uh, if we unlock the last, the ultimate stretch goal, every backer who backs at a hardcover gets a um, free download of a Tales of Mystery video game, Punch All Monsters. Why am I I'm first hearing this now? What? Again, I talk about social media all the time. I talk about my newsletter. You know, in fact, my new newsletter, I even sent out a clip of the graphic of it. That's costing a little bit of money out of pocket for me to do. But at that point, it's just fun. I want to be the first comic book campaign in history to offer a free video game with the Kickstarter, with a book. But again, that's something that I'm doing not only for me, but I'm also doing it for my readers. Mm -hmm. And because admittedly... I'm a little nuts, I guess, to do this. But yeah, Austin McKinley, he's been sending me screen caps and sent me the 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 the, the gif of the mystery walking and stuff. But yeah, and uh, we're only we're only about a thousand dollars or so away with thirteen days left. Oh wow! And everyone gets a free video game download. Where, where can they download it from? Like, what what's the the engine that it's coming from, or is it like a separate game? That you I think we're going to offer we're going to offer a direct download to the game, and you can play it on your cell phone, you can play it on your computer. It'll probably ultimately go through Steam or something like that. <laughs> Admittedly, I'm not a huge video game fan, but Austin McKinley, who's the illustrator of Revolume Five, Austin and I've been friends for over 20 years. He's done a lot of work in video game design. So when we started working on Tales of Mystery Volume Five, I said, "Hey man, wouldn't this be wild?" And we talked and we agreed upon a price that I would I would pay to develop this and in and, and a and an agreement on what revenue sharing would look like moving forward if we unlock the game and then you know people get it for free if they back the campaign, but eventually we'll then release the game through Steam or whatever. And uh, yeah. <laughs> so again, very high value, but to me, I even had to make a deal with the publisher. I'm paying for the game separately. That's not coming out of the, the Kickstarter money. That's like a separate business venture altogether. It is making a video game. And yeah, it's, um, if people read my, people at DirkManning.com, you can send my newsletter. Um, the last newsletter I just sent out has a screen cap at the end of, of the game. And I'm like, my God, this is happening. Like, this is insane. We're actually making a video game. We're about $1,000 and change away. We're like actually about $1,300 away from unleashing a free video game for everyone. The one thing that is interesting about crowdfunding campaigns specifically, and this happens in video games, this happens in, in these types of exclusives as well too. So it's not just comic books and not just crowdfunding. The fear of missing yes. out is something that is a huge, to a certain extent, it could be considered a predatory tactic, but it could also be considered um, the ability to, you know, drive interest to your product itself as well too right is is fear of missing out considered in crowdfunding a, a tactic that's used subconsciously or is it something that is not really in the mind of the creator of the campaign itself it's just here's my product here's what i want to showcase to you if you want it you know here you go I mentioned earlier a moral sense of urgency and moral may be a little bit strong so we can go with that fomo absolutely uh, to me, that's imperative. You have to create a reason for people to pre-order your book. And to me, that is a foundational piece of what makes a Kickstarter successful or not. You know, knowing that this is the only, like Tales of Mystery, again, if you want the hardcover of the Omnibus or the hardcover of Volume 5, there's still a chance you have to get them. Period. You got a 30-day 30, 30 window, that's it. I announced on Halloween a surprise upgrade to the Omnibus being hardcover. The Tales of Mystery Omnibus will eventually come out through, through SourcePoint Press, through Simon & Schuster, through bookstores everywhere, and it's going to be a trade paperback. It's going to be a 550-page compendium. However, if you want the hardcover edition, you have 30 days to pre-order it. 
and that's it. Otherwise, you miss out. And people always come to me, oh, do you got any extra ones? I, I don't know if I will. You know, maybe. I mean, you always do a little bit of overage for damages and things like that. But the other thing is, even if I have a few extras laying around, you're not going to get them for the price that people got them on Kickstarter. <laughs> you know, that, that's, that's the hookup. But yeah, uh, and, and realistically, you just don't get them at all. With the Tales Mystery campaign, I, I literally found a box, and I'm not exaggerating, I found a box of extra Bibles. It was a mismarked box from, you know, and I had the, the, the cause I went to pick up the box, I'm like, that's really heavy. I'm like, oh my gosh, these are Bibles. This isn't the omnibus. But that's a fluke thing. You know, if you want to buy the Nightmare Old Omnibus, you can get the Omnibus. You can't get this anymore. If you did not back that campaign, you don't get this. Except for now with the Tales of Mystery campaign, I've decided to offer those extra ones I found on the campaign. But yeah, I, th I think you have to. I, I think one of the most fundamental elements of having a successful Kickstarter campaign is fairly tapping into FOMO if you're missing out. And that's okay. You know, I mean, I understand some people won't be able to get it. Some people just want the trade paperback. Fine. But if you want all the stretch goal extras, you want the bonus comics, you want the book plates, you want the art print, you want the free video game, talesofmystery.com. You have till November 19th to pre-order. And that's it. The reason why I'm, I'm harping on fear of missing out is it's interesting the, for the fact that crowdfunding taps into that 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 aspect like like you, you just you talked over exactly what exactly what fear missing out truly is especially when it comes to great products and, and everything like that but from a psych from a psychological perspective though that can be very detrimental to someone that supported yourself as a creator in the past or those that support other campaigns as well in the past maybe that one this one particular time they're not able to actively support this campaign from a, from a mental standpoint, you know, as a creator, what does that speak? How does that speak to you? Yeah. I, I mean, I get it. And there's times I wanted to buy things. I couldn't, I love books. You can see just even on what you can see in my office right now, I'm surrounded by books and I love fancy books. You know, I was showing on a, a live stream. I talk about how much I love the crow and James O'Barr. This is like a slipcase version of the graffiti book that includes the CD from 1994. I love stuff like this, but I also recognize you can't buy everything you want. I'm a huge fan of uh, writer Harlan Ellison. He did this book. Uh, they published this book, uh, Harlan Ellison Under Glass. And it was all the stories that he wrote in window, in, in live signings. He would write stories like in a window of a bookstore. And he always said that one day he wanted to have a version of the book that had a glass cover on it. So it was like literally wow. under glass. And when that book came out, it was several hundred bucks. And it was even more than that if you wanted like the super limited edition signed version and things like that. I just didn't have it. I didn't have the money. And I didn't get a chance to get it. It is what it is. Um, sometime later, I found an unsigned version of the book. And I just happened to have a little, uh, a little bit of disposable income at the moment. I thought, you know... That FOMO creeps in, like, am I going to get a chance to get this down the road? And I had to make a choice. How am I going to spend this money? I bought the book. As a collector, there's always going to be things I want and don't get. One of my book voices is I have every book written by Joe Hill, signed by Joe Hill in hardcover. It's fun to do. Uh, I'm a Stephen King fan. Joe Hill's Stephen King's son. I would love to have first editions of all the Stephen King stuff, but I got to be realistic too. I guess the other part of this to be, again, to be transparent is if I know someone has backed a lot of my campaigns, they've backed a lot of my work and things like that. And they say, Dirk, I'm in a bad spot right now. You know, I, I would love to get the Tales of Mystery Volume 5 hardcover. I'm just not there. You know, my, my transmission went out. I had a situation come up. If I have a... a personal professional relationship with someone and I know they back a lot of my stuff I'll find a way to make it work you know I'll, I'll find a way but again that comes back to that 
finding your crowd and activating your crowd. If some rando just comes up and says, hey, you know, I, I, I missed this Kickstarter campaign, that's a different conversation. You know, I mean, because you do have a moral obligation to honor the fact that these are Kickstarter exclusives. So, you know, we got to be fair. You can't get everything you want. I can't get everything I want. No one get everything they want. But if I can create a proposition to make it worth their while, so be it. And if I have people that back a lot of my stuff or support my work and they say, you know, I missed that campaign for, for volume five, is there anything we can do? Those are people I'm going to do what I can to help out a little bit more as opposed to someone that just wants to buy a Nightmare World Bible just to flip it. It's, it's always interesting to, to see the mindset of, of the, uh, the other side of the campaign, so to speak, the, the supporters and all that other stuff as well, too. And I know there's been campaigns where, you know, I've loved to have helped support them. And the only thing I can do at that time is to share their Kickstarter link or to yeah. s- share on social media. You know, it, it's it sucks, but that's that's the case. Financially, we're not always in a great place, like you said. So, and, and, and let me say, too, real quick. Sharing the campaign is awesome. And that's not a, I could, that's all I could do. That's appreciated. Every time you log into social media, you have a choice to post anything you want. And the fact that you see enough value in a creator or a project to share it, Kurt, that's amazing. So when you do that, don't ever, ever, and for everyone else who's watching this, don't ever downplay what a difference that makes. The number one reason that campaigns are successful is personal recommendations. Think of it like a restaurant. Let's say that you and I are at Motor City Comic Con or something. And you might say, oh, I'm in town and, you know, I'm really hungry. What's a good place to go eat, Dirk? And I'll say, oh, we'll go to this place over here. That's going to carry a lot of weight. Sharing sharing on social media is the same way. And, and I tell all my backers all the time, I said, the more, we on, the more funding we get, the more stuff everyone gets. I tell everybody, if you know one person who you think might like this campaign, Give them the link. Give them talesofmystery.com. Send them to Kickstarter and look up Mr. Ree. Or just type into Kickstarter Ree, R-H-E-E. Tell them to go look at the campaign. That personal recommendation is powerful. You know, I don't need to sell to everyone. Tales of Mystery is not a book for everyone. It's a Cthulhu noir. It's a 700-page story and counting. Uh, it's a horror comic. People that only read Green Lantern are not going to necessarily enjoy or not necessarily going to be motivated to buy Tales of Mystery. No, they might like it. It might become their new favorite thing. But personal recommendations and shares and just a message to them saying, hey, I know this guy who's doing this campaign and you might like this book. That means a lot. I mean to cut you off. I apologize. But no, no, that's no. so crucial. And, and, and thank you for doing that stuff. I mean, 13 years of interviewing people like yourself and, and everything like that and, and- – variety of genres in entertainment industry you know you do what you can to support however you can whether it's doing an interview like this or whether it's supporting their campaign through kickstarter etc or whether it's just a simple social media share i do what i can to showcase the um, different talents of the different genres that happen to come across by my viewpoint and i'm sure i've missed a bunch of people in the past as well too but i i try to make that up in the future we're slowly wrapping this up here, and I greatly appreciate this. I'm not going to bother uh, going into the introspective thing because this is all about crowdfunding and Kickstarter campaigns. Before I let you go, of course, and we've been talking about this throughout the entire interview, but how can we support you on social media? How can we support the campaign? And how can we see your stuff in the future? Because you know what? After this is done, I'm going to that campaign. I'm, I want that damn video game. I do too. <laughs> <laughs> this is just nuts. Like, Yeah. It, it, it's insane. Um, yeah, people, uh, to find me on social media, you see the little avatar down there of the little guy top end scarf. That's my, my avatar. Look for Dirk Manning on social media. You know, um, I'm on Facebook, Instagram, God help me, even Twitter. To check out the campaign, go to kickstarter.com and type in Re, R-H-E-E, or you can go to Tales of Mystery, which, you know, the, the name is right here on the graphic as well. Just Tales of Mystery.com. No period in the middle. Um, we'll go to kickstarter.com and type in re, R-H-E-E. We're doing a campaign for the Tales of Mystery Volume 5, as well as the Tales of Mystery Omnibus. 
Tales of Mystery Volume 5 is Game of Act 2. It is a perfect jumping on point for the whole series. Uh, the setup on the book is there's a uh, street-level magician, Mr. Ree, and he has to kind of broker an uneasy alliance between demons and demon hunters alike in order to stop an evil rock band from resummoning the Great Cthulhu. Austin McKinley is the illustrator. Uh, Ringo Award nominated colorist Alessandro DeFornasari is the uh, colorist and letterer on the book. Regina Joe's the editor. Powerhouse team. Perfect jumping on point for the series. If you're a completist, we're also offering the Tales of Mystery Omnibus Act One. It collects the first four volumes into a 550 page book. Uh, we talked about that FOMO earlier, Kurt. This campaign is the only way that you can get the Omnibus as a hardcover and then Tales of Mystery Volume 5 as a hardcover. Not to mention all the other stretch goals. Not to mention we're closing and unlocking a video game. Uh, there's a both books pledge. You can get both books. Uh, we're offering a re-beanie, a re if you will, like a stocking cap with a mystery sigil on it. Uh, there's some, still some chances to get drawn into volume six. I think maybe the Bibles are sold out. There might be one left. The number of Bible. But go and check it out and, and pledge to a level of comfort. The stretch goals, all the stretch goals come with any pledge level that includes a hardcover. Whether you get just the omnibus whether you get just get volume five, or ideally, what I would recommend everyone is you get both. Um, yeah, so go to Kickstarter, type in RE, R H E E, and look for that campaign. Um, or find me on social media at Dirk Manning at pretty much all platforms. Well, for the most hosted guest on Two Geeks Talking, yeah. I do greatly appreciate you coming back on the show, of course, as always. You dropped a lot of great information especially when from a crowdfunding campaign for someone that's been successful in the past with campaigns and continues to be successful with it and i hope anyone that watches this interview or listens to it can at least take a little bit of words of wisdom and tidbits and nuggets of success for their future campaigns as well too thank you that you know paying it forward is very important to me i really appreciate this opportunity to get to talk about it you know a cheap future plug Right around volume two, when it comes out, is going to talk a lot about crowdfunding, a lot about Kickstarter. But in the meantime, I, I do sincerely appreciate the opportunity to come on here and talk about this to all of you listening. We live just an incredible time for comics. The quality of comics has never been higher. The opportunity has never been higher. That's not to say it's easy, um, but the opportunities are there, you know, and, and I appreciate, Kurt, all the support you've shown me over the years, but the chance to come on and get to talk about the process work with you is 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 really an honor thank you i appreciate it you're welcome well that ends this particular episode of two geeks talking you of course find dirk on all of the social media and his kickstarter campaigns as he's just previously mentioned and of course you can find this interview and all of his other interviews at least most of them on our website tgtmedia.com or two geeks talking.com and on our youtube channel youtube.com forward slash c forward slash tgt media and as i say every week everyone has a story to tell it's up to me to help bring that up thanks for listening and watching on two geeks talking